Hey, how's it going, everybody? I thought I'd do something different. I was sitting there reminiscing over some old music done on cassettes um, from from the early 80s, from the 80s and the 90s, um, when I was just, uh, you know, when I was really getting into recording and, and collaborating and, and the whole nine, of course, like a lot of people in that time frame, you had to make do with what you had. And um, well, I'll give you a quick story before I, I'm gonna play some. I'm gonna play some stuff, and uh, some of the stuff is so. Some of this stuff is so badly recorded. It's just. It's. It's like I listen to it now. It's like, yeah, this is the reason why professional studios. You know, you know. Uh, but thank God we can do what we can do today, because I'm laughing because the options weren't great. You didn't have a whole lot of options back in the 80s, right? So, um, quick story. I, I remember I used to go to this lady's house. She had a four track and a couple of keyboards and record some stuff on there. And the way you did it then, you just had to record what you could record. You had to literally play it. And if you didn't like it, you had to redo it. So, I thought this would be funny. I'm going to play, um, I'm going to play a cassette. Uh, this and I'll, and I'll, I'll, well, I'm just gonna play it. Um, and when I look back at it, um, when I look back at it, it's like, thank God, I was, thank goodness, and thank God I was fortunate enough to be where I am today, compared to doing this 30, almost 40. <laughs> this is so, this stuff is so old, but. Um, I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play some stuff, and this is. This is I'm gonna have to adjust the volume level because this, the mix is so bad. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, the mix is so bad. Um, <laughs> just like it's god awful. Um, but you know we may do. Uh, I'll just let you be the judge of it. Okay. The drums are just, oh my God. <laughs> I had to laugh because that's 1989, and I'll tell you what I'll tell you what we were using. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing because it's funny to me. All I had, <laughs> all I had was two. I had really two cheap keyboards. Um, one was a Yamaha Porter sound, um, and the other one. I believe it was a Casio and the drums that come from the Casio and the drums are so it's it's horrible and it's you if you ever as a keyboard player if you ever deal with Casio in the 80s those type of keyboards the you know the drums are so generic compared to modern boards today the way drums and the sounds are today um, you can actually use the drums and record professional records the G drums are so cheesy. It's like so I would have to go and find presets 
because uh, there was no sequencer on those boards. It was just presets, drum. You had like you had like rock kit, <laughs> bossa nova, salsa kit, and all these different. And they would just start playing, and they would have little feels. You get the feel button, and they go you feel to one, feel to two, then stop, start, and all that. And it was just horrible. It was so horrible. So those are the that's the drum kit from that Casio. And the other keyboard, the Porter sound, at least I can go into the parameters and adjust, and I would make my own little sounds, bass sounds, and so I'm playing the key, I'm playing both at the same time, and then we had another guy, his name was Mark Bocos. We're all in the army. <laughs> He's playing the guitar. And another guy that was singing, his name was Tony Ma Maples. Now, I haven't seen these guys since Korea of 1990. But these, we used to do this. We did this. We did this music in, uh, in uh, his uh, barracks room. So I'll play a little bit more. It's so horrible. Even though the song, the song itself is actually a good song. It's called Curiosity, right? It's got the best of me. It was worrying about if your girl's cheating on you, right? So Tony had this, he had this like, there's a group called Surface. Have you ever heard this group? If you, if you, if you don't know who Surface is, Surface is a group. Um, Surface is a group. Um, you know, they made the first time. Um, only you, only you can make me happy. 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 If you go back, it's called Song Happy by Surface. He had that style of voice. But that was a real popular style. The eighties, um, when it came to singers, was all about if your voice was unique. So, okay, I'm gonna go back to a couple more songs on this, and I'm gonna move on to how, when you get better stuff, how it starts to sound better, right? So, let me see. I'm gonna try to go to the next track. Um, Now this is cassette, so you have, literally have to. Isn't once again is that cheat? That one patch has come from the Yamaha Portasan. I'm stopping a little bit, but so the, the premise was that we had so what he did is we would record um the drums uh I would record my parts, then he would he would take that part, take it to another cassette, record from cassette to another cassette, and play other parts, you know, and Mark would play his guitar parts, and then we would dub it back to another cassette, and he would put his vocals on it, and he would try to use like um this like this it was like a reverb called an echo from a stereo system to try to put a little reverb on it 
and then you get the, you get what you got right so that's why the sound quality would diminish because that's what would happen when you bounce music from one cassette to another the sound quality would diminish as you bounce one from cassette to cassette to cassette so that's one more i'm gonna try to play one more that's how cheesy you know and like i said it was just two cheap keyboards um let me see And on this one, the drums are a little bit better because I actually used the drummers, the drum patches from the Yamaha, not the Casio. Them drum fills were just horrible. <laughs> they was just <laughs> Casio. No wonder, can't, no wonder Casio didn't make it in the, in the keyboard industry. itself the song itself you gotta remember this is 1989 1990 so the when you wrote music that was what was the r&b style then right um so that that was common writing even though that's a bad recording you probably heard if you go back in the, in the 1980s you go back to the 80s that you hear that style of r&b that was common so any one of my uh, old school subscribers that are watching this video um, they can relate to that style of writing and the style of music it's just that at that time I wrote it on the back there too I wrote on the cassette 1990 Korea I was in Korea I was in the army and we did that in his bedroom there's more songs on there they just they're just so horribly recorded because all I had was a, a cheap I think I bought that Casio I was at Fort Gordon. I think I bought that Casio uh, for like ninety nine dollars, which was equivalent to like three four hundred dollars today. <laughs> but ninety nine was like a ninety nine dollar Casio, and then I bought the Yamaha Porter Sound. Um, I got a picture of me in Korea with those two keyboards. They were just cheap keyboards, and so when I got to, so when I got to um, Fort Hood. And this, you know, going into '91, the Sonic boards were really hot boards. I wanted a, I wanted a Korg M1, until I heard the Insonics. and that's the Insonic I have now, the SQ1 Plus I still have today. I got that board in the early '90s, early '90s, and that's the board I was gigging when we was gigging on Sixth Street. Um, I was in a band called Legit. Our pictures on the wall over here. I was in a band called Legit, and I bought this board. But I bought this board because you could sequence. And the effect process, the effect processor in that keyboard, um, along with the with the TS boards and the Insonic boards all together, was so good that Insonic made an actual reverb rack unit that went in all and went to a lot of pro studios. That Insonic is called the DP4. It's a very very popular effect processor. You know, we always seen the Lexicons and all that. That was a very effective, but it's still a, it's still an expensive effect processor well that board has the same in there so with that i finally got a board a better sounding board that could sequence and so this is all come from cassettes these you know what i love about the beauty of like these are cassettes and these were maxwell's and you know you could buy maxwell's and tdk's and all these cassettes and put your all your stuff on cassettes you know you know the beauty this is 1991 right and now you can say I got loads of them. This stuff, never, the music on here never goes away. <laughs> you could play this 
I'm playing this to this day. I recorded this back in 1991. Uh, but anyhow, so uh, here we go. Let me turn the volume so it's so. So this is all cassette uh, coming from the sequencer on my Sonic. So I would just make these are gonna be instrumentals. There's no vocals on these, but fast forward to what a couple more so the premise was that that's all coming from the sequencer from the keyboard and I just would take the output from the keyboard record it to I had a Hitachi double cassette boombox so I just record to that let me see so I would just record to that and then bounce it on with cassettes and and that's before I start recording so I think, let me see, what is this one? Enough of that for now. So the idea was um, that the sound quality started getting better. <laughs> uh, it started getting better for one because I got a better keyboard, <laughs> so and I can sequence. And so I, I was seek. I was that's all I would do um, if I wasn't playing in the band. Uh, we weren't gigging somewhere, practicing somewhere. I was writing tracks. So I got into I didn't have no gear. All I had was just my keyboard. All I had was just that in Sonic and a double cassette player. And I would sequence everything on that board. So um, no computer, no DAW, none of that, because it's 1991. So uh, some more stuff uh, I was recording to. So that's why this, all this stuff is on cassette. <laughs> So, uh, so this is, you know, like I said, all this dated music, right? All this dated music from, you know, from playing on two cheap keyboards and a, on a little cheap stereo deck to a sequence on the keyboard, um, which it's tons of, it's tons and tons of more music. And then finally, uh, about 93 is going to 94. I met a producer that had a independent he had his own record label his own recording studio his own independent label called technique records and uh, we still talk to this day we still talk to this day and how we met 
was uh, he had a group. They needed music. Um, and so I collaborated him to start creating his track because what he did was he had Disney tracks, but he was not a keyboard player. So I took the trip keyboard tracks and I was, um, I said, let me take the music back and redo the music. Um, let me read that. Let me redo the music. And, um, and after he heard what I did, he said, yes, yeah, come on. And so I became part of the production team. So the, so the thing is same keyboard, but difference in this, and of course it's not mixed well because I didn't know what I was doing. Right. I really didn't know what I was doing. This is 1994, right? I didn't really know what I was doing, but it was the first time I actually been on an actual recording console, the Tascam M520. And we had actual, some actual outboard gear, nothing like what I got in here, you know, but we did have some compressors, some reverb units, an actual, um, and I was using, um, I was using, um, Move this out there because I think the fan is blowing on the uh, microphone, um, but it's hot. Um, so, so, when I took the same keyboard and I started using Cakewalk software because he showed me how to use Cakewalk software, and I start midding through that and running through the console, it became night and day. Why? How music's how your music is so much enhanced when you go to 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 an actual studio, compared to like coming from just a sequence off a keyboard or cheap stuff, right? So this is one of the tracks. Um, let me see. I'm gonna play a couple of instrument. I'm gonna play a couple of tracks uh, from this. Um, like I said, it's not mixed well because I know what I was doing, but the the sound. You know, this is coming through an actual that same my insane Sonic. Now it's going through an, a task cam analog console okay okay let me go back let me turn that off because that's blowing across the mic and making the mic go you know all that so I'm gonna try to adjust this because it's a mix It's still on cassette, so it's doing. And this cassette is four, 30 years old. That song was originally called a song called Prove It. Um, we never put that out. I wish we had put that on the album. Um, I'll play a little bit of, well, I guess I can play a few tracks from the album. Um, you know, I guess I could play a few tracks, but in the nineties, around 95, we, we put out a CD uh, called, it's called A Different Taste. Um, and we did it as an independent label because the girls couldn't, you know, Grover tried, you know, to try to get these girls, but it was so hard to get them signed, you know, uh, talking to Arista and Jive Records and all that. So we ended up staying independent and everything else, but it did get put out. Um, and it actually, which is going to be a different video, going to be a different video um, on the whole, a different taste um, story. But uh, so I... That makes no sense. Why well, I'm I don't know why that's, I'm not touching. It makes no sense. Anyhow, so um okay, so let me see. This album called A Different Taste. Um, it's still available, but not like it used to be because this we're talking '95. So let me see. Remember this, that I am forever yours. 
This is from the album, actually. And then that's, um, let me see, next track. Like, I'm gonna go to number 10. That's one of my favorite songs from the album. It's called Baby, Come Back to Me. Of course, there's, there's 13 songs on the album, but that's the same in Sonic Keyboard. But now, what what has happened? Let me turn this back because it's, it's hot. It makes no sense, but it's hot up here. Um, that's the same keyboard. Um, all I use, all I, other than just using a, like an Elisa D4 drum module and a Yamaha TZ, it's a TZ81Z or something like that. It was basically the sound module to the DX7, stuff like that. But that was mostly 90% was coming from my Insonic. Same board, but this time, instead of our studio, we went down and did it down in Austin on a, an actual analog console on two inch tape. So, um, so that's the album. So, um, so that's, that's all I really, um, really want to play, um, how from like 89 using cheap, um, from using cheap keyboards to buy a, a, an actual, that board, I think it cost me $1,400 back in 1991 and start doing my music on that. And then I started getting to the studio where I actually where you was actually an actual analog console using cakewalk software um running through some processors and some reverb units and being in the studio environment in the 90 this is 94 um i was sold with the studio environment i was sold um and from there um and how you can create your music is, is I was so based on how when you do stuff in the studio and whether it's your home studio or commercial studio, um, I was so, um, I love how, what sold me to it was you could take something when you create it and then when you, when you, in it when it comes when you do, when it's done in a studio environment how it goes from it's kind of like my the music that i was doing on cheap stuff in korea to industry standard pro level stuff that you know that can make the charts and everything else um just doing stuff in the studio just the outcome and uh and i was that's what sold me on i was so impressed how um it's kind of like that same in sonic keyboard if i you know like playing um um let me like this track right And listening, it's it, 
it blows my mind it's the same keyboard it's the same keyboard um let me pull this out of here pull it and put it in here and let's see if i go um and how like if i play this track So I'm going to play, well, let me play next track. And it, it blows my mind how even from the CD where it was done on, it was done on a, I think it was a 32 or 40. It might've been a 32 or maybe in a, could have been a 48 track. Atari Concept Analog Console. It's digitally controlled with and two inch tape, but this was done, same keyboard. It's, And that's not even mixed well, but um, what blew my mind, what really blew my mind was same keyboard. Um, like I said, I guess I, like I was playing the other track, you know. Um, anyhow, from how it sounded from two cheap keyboards to when I bought my Insonic. And then I start going and just sequencing on my Sonic. Um, let me play, let me play. Well, yeah, like like my Sonic. This is just my Sonic keyboard, right? This track, right? Um, yeah, that's. And that's just the sequencer, right, from the Insonic. You know, and then going from there, uh, going from there to start recording that same Insonic and going into a Tascam, Tascam console, you know. You know, and then, you know, from there, you know, um, and then, you know, from there, same keyboard and sounds. Um, Something wrong with the jack on my, my CD player. And now that's... course this thing really giving it you know justice it sounds a ton better but um how going from one medium and then going to that and we're going on that console and recording the two inch tape machine and using actual gear like this uh and the vocals were done on a, new, a newman u87 microphone and things like that um and it's like that's the same keyboard though it's amazing how studios and and, and and it's like what we got today you know it's so in, it's just like man so i thought i'd share this video with you as a fun video to show you know that reminiscing over 
because I got so much music. It, you know, we're talking on those cassettes. It, it, we'd be here for hours reminiscing over a lot of music that I did. Um, but I thought that was just interesting. List to all the old tracks and how bad they were. And then as you learn and learn, you know, you get better and better, and better, how much better your stuff starts to sound. Um, and to where I'm at today, but it's just, yeah, it's, you know, and even the nineties, I didn't know nowhere near like the of uh, when it comes to recording and, and gear and equipment and, and I didn't know nowhere near that much then, like I know now, um, I was just, you know, but I knew one thing when I went from for sequences on my keyboard to going to that studio and start recording how the stuff was coming through that console, I was hooked. I was hooked. So that's going to do it for the video. Thanks for watching. Um, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. Y'all have a good one.